Hey, I'm Scott. And I'm Chris. And this is Doxologic, where we help you think with your Bible. Okay, next question. How does Satan actually attack us? What are schemes of the devil and flaming arrows talked about in Ephesians 6? Mm. Can Satan read our minds, plant thoughts, or cause fleshly desires in us? Also, does he have influence on us in situations spelled out in James 1, 13 through 15? Okay, so there's a lot there. Yeah. Um, Compared to the extremely direct question see, that we see, just but had. But if you get your question the, the asked, you got to get them all in there at <laughs> totally. the same time. I got six <laughs> questions, man. I just got to get it in one paragraph. <laughs> I love yeah, that. Yeah, that's true. I love that. Okay. So, so Ephesians 6 gets mentioned and James 1. Yeah, uh, and then uh, several questions about Satan's ability to kind of do this or that. I'll say, let's let's understand from from Ephesians six um, that while you have the word in verse eleven to stand against the schemes of the devil, you've also got a plurality of spiritual enemies that are clearly articulated in verse twelve. That our battle our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So Satan can sometimes be uh, more of a caricature. Uh, in our minds, maybe pop culture wise or whatever, than is actually um, given to us in the scriptures. It's not going to be Satan uh, himself against you, individual Christian, almost ever. It's going to be the spiritual enemies of our soul, of which he is a significant part, right, in the mm-hmm. biblical cosmology of spiritual beings. But there are, the, so it's the, it's the enemies of our soul mm-hmm. that we're talking about as well, that we may call demons, um, fallen angels, but uh, I just wanted to throw that out there yeah, categorically. Good. Yeah, that's good. That's really helpful. That's good. And I think maybe another just piece of that is uh, uh, God flesh, or uh, world flesh Satan. Yeah. World flesh powers Spiritual and principalities. Enemies. Yeah, yeah. However you want to do that, the right. authorities in the, in the demonic realm. Uh, all of those play into uh, our um, being tempted to, to sin, um, being engaged in um, an, an allure towards ungodliness and all of that stuff. And But what's interesting is that, but when you've committed the sin, no one's responsible for that but you. Right. You may have been tempted. It, you could blame it on the flesh. The, and sometimes it's hard to tell. Are they working together? It, right. it all could be that way. I think it's mm-hmm. less important to discern. It was the flesh that did it. It was the you know it was my flesh that did it. It was this that did it. When you sin, you need to own. I sinned. Mm-hmm. Yes, there are influences. There is a course to this world. There is an enemy who is against you. There is the flesh that is waging against the work of the spirit mm-hmm. of Galatians mm-hmm. five. All of that is taking place, right? Yeah. And so a lot of times it's like, wait, can the enemy do that? The bottom line is you can do that. Right. Right? And it may be that the world's influencing you in any the given— pressures. The pressures the, of— The yeah. messaging, the mm-hmm. pressures. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Convincing towards something, but yeah. we will participate at some level in that. We won't be made to sin by the world or by— Satan or spiritual enemies. Yeah. And yeah. I want to read, uh, let, let, turn to James 1, if you would, Scott. I'm going to okay. read real quick here, make a comment on Ephesians 6 uh, regarding the shield of faith uh, and, well, the flaming darts. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And then he goes on. This is in the middle of his description of the armor of God. But in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. I mm-hmm. would argue that. That allows for a very broad description of what might qualify as a flaming dart of the evil one. Mm -hmm. It may not always be um, something that we are cognizant of in the moment, or we have to train our mind to like know exactly what they are all the time. But they could come in the form of temptations, could come in the form of discouragements. Not every thought that crosses our mind is like just originating within ourselves. But that's not the same thing as to say that the devil personally or even spiritual enemies control our mind. It's that there are messages of accusation and of unbelief and of temptation and of doubt and of accusation toward God against his character that that are are swirling about, right? And, and we can hold up the shield of faith, whatever they may be, as flaming darts of the evil one, we can extinguish those by holding on strong 
which is by God's grace and by the power of the Spirit, but two, that faith in the Lord Jesus and our identity in Christ. And so whatever they may be, Mm -hmm. I do think they're pretty broad in the way this is said here. In all circumstances, you can extinguish all the flaming darts, whatever they may be, um, but it's not going to be a control of our mind Mm -hmm. in this way. But James... Well, let, and let me one just add well. one thing to that, because yeah. Second Corinthians came to mind where Paul says, for we're not outwitted by Satan's designs. Right. And Satan wants to keep us. If there's any in- inclination of Satan, it's to keep, when we've sinned, keep us there. Yeah. Keep us in that sin. And so what's the particular sin, for example, in Second Corinthians 10? Anyone whom you forgive, I also forgive. Indeed, what I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, has been for your sake in the presence of Christ, so that we would not be outwitted by Satan. For we are not ignorant of his designs. So what is that telling me? Unforgiveness is a huge category. That uh, it, yeah. It, yeah. Right? That, mm-hmm. that we need to be mindful of the fact that Satan wants to keep us in a place of unforgiveness. Satan wants to keep us in a place of bitterness. Satan wants to keep us in a place of resentment, right? And there's freedom in repentance. There's freedom in returning back to the Lord. We understand his schemes because we know that he wants us detached from the Lord. We know he wants us to be caught up in our sin. So yeah. that's, I just, it came to mind. James 1, this is what was asked at the end. Uh, It says this, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. So we don't see Satan yeah. in James 1. We see a lot of personal responsibility. Let them not say they are tempted by God, for God does not tempt anyone toward evil, is not tempted toward evil, but he, this is the personal responsibility part. We are tempted when he's lured and enticed by his own desire, which gives birth to sin. Sin gives birth to death. You, you, so um, compassionately to this question asker, with all of those questions, I, I, I sense that there's an... There was a, there's a lack of critical thinking among the concepts to include James 1 in a question about whether the devil does it or not, because James very clearly does nothing about the devil's participation in this. And I'm not trying to blame the person, but I would say let's think critically, categorically about where we see his work and where, like, James 1 has nothing to do with that. It's personal responsibility about our own lures and being tempted toward our own evil desires. Mm-hmm. You've been listening to Doxologic, a podcast by Doxa Church in Rockland, California. To learn more, visit us online at doxa.church. Mm-hmm.